All right, I'm going to get started. I'll just uh, remind everybody to mute yourself so that we don't have any um, sort of distractions or chatter in the background. Um, if you are seeing me and you're surprised, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, hopefully you got the email. Uh, we had a guest uh, lecturer planned for tonight. She was going to, she's a lawyer. She was going to talk about the legal aspects of uh, EMS and documentation and such, but life happens and she got called away to an important meeting and uh, she uh, let me know earlier today. So we were able to put this together for tonight. Um, we um, will make every effort we can to get back to uh, the legal aspects of EMS with, uh, you know, someone from the, the world of law or lawyer or whatever. We, um, we will, we will um, eventually hit that topic. So, um, so tonight, um, uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, it's kind of along the, the lines of the legal stuff. So it's, uh, it's diagnosis you don't want to miss. And, and uh, you know, this is a optical illusion here of the elephant, you know, because things aren't always what they seem. And hopefully, um, you know, we'll see how that works out with these diagnoses that we talk about. So, um, you know, we certainly want to kill as few patients as possible, right? We, we don't want to miss things that um, you know, may do, certainly may do harm to our patients or, or, you know, eventually lead to their demise. But so again, these are um, some diagnoses that, uh, that we'll talk about tonight. Um, so recognizing the threat to patient survival. And what I did was I um, used threat here as a um, mnemonic. So threat, if you look at threat, the definition of threat is an indication of impending danger or harm, right? We know that. So, but Again, I use threat as an acronym for the six diagnoses you don't want to miss in emergency medicine. And we don't want to miss it in the ER. You don't want to miss it in the field. Um, and again, um, you know, these are things that we can kind of look out for. So what we'll do is we'll just go by, you know, we'll just do um, six different scenarios. We'll uh, present the case and, and uh, you know, some of them are, are obviously not that difficult. But um, again, six things that we, we don't want to miss if, if possible, right? So our first scenario is a 23-year-old uh, male. He walks into your fire station. He's covered in blood. He states that was, he was attacked by two dudes and he was stabbed. Now, anybody in EMS or emergency medicine knows the rule of twos, right? It's always two dudes. It's always two beers. Um, everything comes in twos. So, um, so again, you, you know, he walks into your station, he's covered in blood, says he was stabbed. And, you know, you quickly do your ABCs like you normally would. And you, on your secondary exam, you see that he has a stab wound to his right mid back. When you listen to his lungs in that side, lung sounds are decreased on the right and his respiratory rate is 38. So he kind of looks like this. This is his, you know, the, uh, a picture of his back. You can see the stab wound on the, the right mid back there. Uh, so what's under what, what's underlying that part of his anatomy? Um, well, certainly his lung, right? So this is uh, what we're worried about is a punctured lung. And if we looked at, you know, with our x-ray vision, if we looked at this guy and, you know, forget about the rib fractures that are there, and you can see that what happened is, is that his lung collapsed, right? So when he got stabbed in the, uh, in the back, the knife went into his lung and kind of popped it like a balloon, right? So his, uh, his lung collapsed on that side. And what happens is we know the lung in, uh, you know, normal anatomy, the lung kind of moves around every time we breathe. So it has to be in a sort of a well lubricated uh, area. And there's uh, two pleura uh, around that surround the lung. The parietal pleura is the, um, the pleura or the space uh, or the, the surface, I should say, on the inside of the chest wall. And then there's the visceral pleura, which lines the lung itself. And between those two are, uh, is a potential space called the intrapleural space. Now, normally we have a little bit of fluid in there. Again, the lung has to be able to move back and forth uh, you know, every time we take a breath. So normally this is a, a potential space. And again, sometimes there's a little bit of uh, um, lubricant in there. But what happens is, is you know, when you get, in this case, stabbed, or you have some other things that happen, and we'll talk about that, if air gets into that space, that's a that then that potential space then becomes filled with air, and then it causes the lung then to collapse. And you can see that in the diagram. That's what happened to this guy when he got stabbed. So again, this is a, a collapsed lung. If we if we see it on X-ray, we can see that his you know the chest wall on, on that side is mostly filled with air, and the lung has uh, the lung has collapsed down to the you know around the heart here on this side. 
So this is, you know, we're going to operate under our trauma protocol. Certainly this is a, a stab wound and, and now, you know, a collapsed lung. So certainly something that we are, you know, generally concerned about. But what's our, our true concern is this, right? Is if the pressure builds up on one side of the chest where the, after the um, stab wound and pushes everything over to the other side of the chest. And again, this is what we call a tension pneumothorax, right? So this guy ended up with a tension pneumothorax and just by definition, a tension pneumothorax is air under pressure. So the air that becomes trapped in that intrapleural space is under pressure and can't get out. So it starts to um, cause some, some problems that way. So the injured tissue forms a one-way valve. So again, air can get into that pleural space, but it can't get out. So air just builds up and builds up and builds up and becomes um, pressurized. The thing about tension pneumothorax, the thing to remember is that it is a clinical diagnosis. And we'll talk about that as we, uh, as we talk more about it, but it's something that you wanna be able to pick up clinically or at least suspect clinically and it, because it is a life-threatening condition. And, and this is something that, again, this is one that we don't want to miss. So how do they happen? Well, certainly in this case, it was trauma. It was a penetrating trauma. It can happen from blunt trauma, uh, you know, somebody in an, an MVC or a fall where they have blunt trauma to the chest wall. Um, barotrauma, so positive pressure ventilation. People who are on a ventilator or you're ventilating with, uh, you know, a bag valve mask or something, if they if there's a, a hole in their lung and you, you know, keep putting air in and, and the air develops in an intrapleural space and becomes under pressure, then you can actually cause a, um, a tension pneumothorax. Back in the day, uh, you know, people who have been in EMS a long time, you may remember the demand valves we used to have that just, you know, you could probably just blow somebody's lungs up quite easily. Um, CVT, CVP placement. So for putting a central line in, you know, certainly uh, somebody's at risk for, you know, you can certainly puncture a lung and cause a uh, tension pneumothorax. Conversion of a simple pneumothorax. There are people who, you know, develop simple pneumothoraces. They have uh, abnormalities in their lungs. And um, just over time, if that, again, if that air builds up in, uh, in, the, in that space and causes pressure, then a simple pneumothorax can convert to a tension pneumothorax. If we put an occlusive dressing over an open pneumothorax, and we've probably, you know, you, you learn this as an EMT and, and even probably as a first aider, right? If you somebody has a what we call a sucking chest wound or an open chest wound, you don't want to seal it all the way because you want the air to be able to get out. And this, uh, um, and that's the reason for that. If we if we leave a side open, the air can escape. If not, if we seal it completely, then you are putting air under pressure in that space. Chest compressions during CPR, again, uh, things that sometimes can't be avoided. You sometimes break ribs. You sometimes cause um, some problems. Pneumoperitoneum is uh, just air in the abdominal cavity. And again, this can track up into, the, into that intrapleural space. Bronchoscopy biopsy, of course, anything that, you know, any procedures that are invasive procedures that are done um, by doctors in the hospital or in the operating room, et cetera, um, you know, can certainly cause it. And thoracic spine fractures because of the sharp, uh, you know, pointy bone can, can certainly cause a puncture of the lung. So again, these, it can occur in any of these ways, but, it, you know, for this case, it's penetrating trauma, um, uh, you know, for this guy who was stabbed. So pathophysiology, it's non-usable, non-observable, intrapleural air, um, that increases with each inspiration because of the one-way valve effects. So every time you take a breath, you're adding more air to that space. And then again, eventually it, it comes under pressure. The pressure rises and it you know, shifts to the other side. What happens first is the lung, like in this case, the lung collapsed on the ipsilateral side, on the same side as the chest, um, the chest wound, the stab wound. The lung collapses on that side. And of course, the patient becomes hypoxic because they've lost one lung. But then further pressure builds up. And again, air, air under pressure shifts everything to the other side, starts to impinge on the other side. So you, now you have a collapse of one lung, you have impingement on the other. So certainly the patient becomes more hypoxic. The vasculature entering the right atrium of the heart is compressed and you have decreased uh, cardiac um, output as a result. So it leads to worsening hypoxia and then compromise venous return and, and cardiac output. So you can see this is a sort of a vicious cycle that's just gonna lead to badness, right? And again, you can see that in the picture here. So again, the, the lung collapses, it's air under pressure, pushes everything over to the other side. 
um, causes, causes problems with the other lung as well as re venous return to the heart. Clinically, um, how do these people look? Well, certainly early on in chest pain, of course, right? Because they, you know, they dropped a lung. Dyspnea, uh, again, you know, they're down to one lung. They're certainly short of breath. They can uh, be anxious, um, mostly because of the dyspnea, right? They can't, they feel like they can't breathe, can't take a deep breath, so it certainly makes them anxious. Tachypnea and tachycardia, so they're breathing fast, their heart's beating fast. Again, this is all a reaction to the early on to the to the shock that's happening um, hyper resonance of the chest wall on the effective side this is um, you know something we've lost is the you know the ability to do a good physical exam but if you you know you percuss on the side of the um, pneumothorax it's like percussing over a balloon so it sounds very hyper resonant like a almost like a drum and then of course decreased or diminished breath sounds on that side if the lung has uh, you know if the lung is collapsed you certainly aren't going to hear good breath sounds on that side Later on, you know, that's when, you know, the patient is more and more compromised. The, you know, the lung is down, it's shifted to the other side, it's affecting the other lung, it's affecting cardiac output. So you get a decreased level of consciousness. The trachea may start to deviate to the other side. And again, that's a late sign if you find that uh, on a patient. They become hypotensive because of the, again, decreased cardiac output. Distension of the neck veins because it, the blood can't get back to the heart. And then, of course, they become cyanotic. So again, these are um, later signs that you would see. So let's talk about needle decompression, the treatment. If signs uh, and symptoms attributable to a clinical diagnosis of tension pneumothorax are present, aggressively managed with needle decompression of the chest. So again, this is a diagnosis that we want to make clinically, and we want to treat it right away if we do suspect it happening. So again, there's a uh, specific protocol, you know, as a paramedic option here, there's a specific protocol for needle thoracostomy. And again, you, you know, this same picture, you see that there's air under pressure. And really what you want to do is you want to relieve that air. You want to relieve the air um, in that intrapleural space. And you do that by inserting a big needle into, the, into that space and it will let the air out. So again, this is a temporizing measure that's going to be life-saving. Are there contraindications to that? Well, there are a few contraindications. If they've had a previous thoracotomy, if they've had some kind of surgery, and you know, if they have part of their lung removed, um, if they're on anticoagulants or they have some kind of coagulation disorder. But these are all real relative uh, contraindications because the tension pneumothorax is life-threatening. And if you don't do anything about it, they're going to die from the tension pneumothorax. So I would say that there probably are almost no contraindications that would stop you from doing it. So emergent, emergent needle decompression is, again, we talked about putting a catheter into that space where the air is under pressure and you let the air out. Um, it's not definitive, but it does arrest the progression and restores uh, cardiopulmonary function. So again, this is a life-saving maneuver. So how do we do it? What's the, so, you know, what are the uh, sort of the steps in doing it? Well, certainly you're gonna have somebody, probably gonna have somebody on 100% oxygen anyway. Um, you're ventilating if, if you have to. And then you're going to use a big needle, right? So a large bore. This is like a 14 gauge or a 16 gauge uh, angiocath. Um, you want to get a, a big needle in there for the air to get out. And you go in the second intercostal space, just superior to the third rib, midclavicular line, one to two centimeters from the sternal edge, perpendicular to the chest wall. And, I, and I'll show you a picture of that. Obviously, that's just a, a description of where you are. You're over the, over the top of the third rib. And you want to stay on the top of the rib because the blood vessels and nerves and stuff run under the ribs. So you want to stay on the top edge of the, of the third rib. So again, it kind of looks like this. You can see this is somebody laying down with their head turned to the side. So second intercostal space, uh, midclavicular, just above the, um, just above the third rib is where the, the big angiocath is going to go in. Um, this is uh, what it would look like, you know, for someone who's sitting up. Again, that's the that's the right space. And what you'll hear is you'll hear a hissing sound because if you you know you put that catheter in, you put it into that air that's under pressure, it's going to escape right away, and you're going to hear the a hissing sound of air escaping. Um, and you can take the needle out, and you can actually leave the catheter in. Um, you want to secure it, of course, and if you have the time to put a flutter valve um, in. Um, you can certainly do that. And then this person eventually is going to need a chest tube. 
Now, the thing about a flutter valve is you, you know, once you introduce that catheter and you have that catheter and you leave it in, you know, obviously you have a, there's a conduit for air to get back in, right? So a, a flutter valve is just a, um, a temporizing measure so that air won't go back into that intrapleural space. If you had, they do make them um, commercially available. If you have a flutter valve, that's great. If not, you can uh, cut off a uh, the finger of a rubber glove, stick the catheter through the fingertip of the glove, and then have the the um, you know the glove kind of be your flutter valve. It'll you know it may not work perfectly, but it'll certainly prevent air from going back in through the catheter. And again, chest tube is definitive. This, this will happen when they get to the ER, when they get to the hospital. Um, we're gonna put a tube into that intrapleural space, that, that space where the air is, um, and let the air out. So we can, you know, we can use um, some regulated suction to get the air out of that space, and then the lung eventually will reinflate. This is an X-ray of a, a chest tube. You can see the, um, uh, this white line here is the white line of the chest tube. So again, it's inserted through the ribs, it goes into that space, and then is applied to suction so that it takes the air out of the space and lets the lung re-expand. So that's a tension pneumothorax. Complications, certainly um, if you misdiagnose it, right? If you... Um, if you think it is and isn't, uh, if it's a simple pneumothorax and you put a needle in and you leave the catheter and then you've just converted it to an open pneumothorax, right? Again, you, you now you have a place where air can actually get in. Um, if they don't have a pneumothorax, they will develop one, right? Again, if you put a big needle in somebody's chest, if they didn't have a pneumothorax, well, they, they certainly do now because again, you've uh, introduced air. Some other complications, the needle could lacerate the lung, but not likely because the lung has collapsed. Uh, you could hit an intercostal vessel. Um, again, if you stay on top of the rib as opposed to below the rib, you're, you're, uh, you have a good chance of not hitting any vessels or the internal mammary artery, which uh, again, you have no way of knowing where it is, but you, you know, th there is a possibility that you could hit something like that. But again, this is a life-threatening condition and, and certainly you want to take the chance to do it. So what does an x-ray of a um, tension pneumothorax look like? Um, well, this is sort of a trick question because, again, this is a clinical diagnosis and you really shouldn't ever see an x-ray of a tension pneumothorax. Um, because, again, if you suspect it, if you suspect that it's tension pneumothorax, you shouldn't be sending somebody over to x-ray. Um, and if the x-ray was performed rather than you putting a needle in, then you know, you've wasted time. Um, have we seen x-rays of tension pneumothoraces? Of course we have. Um, but, you know, actually clinically, you should make the diagnosis and um, uh, again, treat it clinically. Uh, any questions, I guess you can, what we'll do is we'll, since we're not live, obviously you can put it into chat and we'll, we'll certainly check afterwards. So again, um, that is our first uh, letter. That's tension pneumothorax is fatigue. All right, moving on. Patient scenario two. This is a 52-year-old male who has a red and painful fingertips. Uh, he comes in and, and sees you. He has really painful fingertips. He was using some sort of uh, household rust remover earlier today on his car. He was cleaning his rims or something. Um, no real trauma, no fever or chills. And he presents with an exam that kind of looks like this. He's got fingers that, that kind of look like this. And again, he was using a rust cleaner. Um, this also, you may also see this in the sort of the jewelry industry. I know there's a big sort of jewelry industry in the North Attleboro, Attleboro area, um, and uh, this is not uncommon to, to see there. This is a hydrofluoric acid burn. Uh, hydrofluoric acid is one of the strongest inorganic acids. It's, again, used in the, in, in, mostly in industrial purposes, um, glass etching, metal cleaning. It's in the, again, it's in the jewelry making business. Um, but again, it's also found in home rust removers and stuff that you would use like, like on your car wheels or something. So um, you may encounter something with hydrofluoric acid in it. Um, the problem with this is that although it's an acid, it produces a liquefaction and necrocrosis similar to alkalis. So it burns deeply. It just keeps burning and penetrating, um, you, you know, unlike an, an acid, which, you know, um, 
kind of seals itself off. Uh, this is a, uh, this kind of burns like an alkali and, and penetrates deeply. Um, and what happens is you can actually see um, delayed injury and symptoms. Um, burns through the fingers and nail beds may leave the overlying nails intact and pain may be severe with little surface abnormality. So again, it, it burns deeply and it may not show um, as much on the surface, may even, even leave the nails intact, which you know, makes it difficult obviously to, to see. So again, it looks something like this. These are, these are pictures of hydrofluoric acid burns. Uh, you can see um, you know, the damage done to the skin there. So the, the problem with these is that uh, the morbidity and mortality comes not from the burn itself, but from hypocalcemia. So um, you get hypocalcemia, you get hyperkalemia, you get hypomagnesemia, and of course, um, you know, death can result. And deaths have been reported from hydrofluoric acid burns to as little as two and a half percent of body surface area. So, you know, this is pretty interesting. This is a, you know, a, a very small burn. Remember the palm of your hand is about 1%. So, you know, two palms and a half and, and you could die from a burn um, that big. And again, it's not the burn, it's the electrolyte abnormalities. What happens is if you look at the you know, the periodic table and you remember back in chemistry, fluoride binds to metal containing enzymes, thereby inactivating them. So the fluoride is the problem in this thing. So fluoride binds calcium resulting in severe hypocalcemia. So that's the fluoride is taking the calcium away. So that's where the hypocalcemia comes from. It also binds to potassium and magnesium leading to myocardial irritability and dysrhythmia. So again, it's all electrolyte abnormalities that are going to that are going to lead to the problems here. And of course, the fluoride itself is directly toxic to the central nervous system. So again, it's the fluoride is the real culprit here. So history and physical, you know, pain is often disproportionate to the apparent skin involvement. Again, it can be a very painful burn. It's continuing to burn. It's burning deeply, but yet the skin may not look so bad on the outside. Um, you may see some symptoms of hypocalcemia, low calcium. And if you, um, if you've ever seen somebody who's hyperventilating, who gets the perioral um, numbness and the, and the tetany uh, in their fingers and toes, um, these are people who are hypocalcemic from, uh, from hyperventilating. But the, you see, so you see the same sorts of things with, with, with this. So tetany, certainly in the, in the fingertips and, the, uh, and toes. Schwastek sign is a, a sign where you tap on the masseter muscle and you get some contraction in the face. And then trousseau sign is when you put a blood pressure cuff on and you know, their hand kind of curls up or cramps up from hypocalcemia. Of course, you can see cardiac dysrhythmias. Again, you got you know, electrolytes swinging all over the place. Um, so this is a burn where you know, even a minor burn, you wanna get an EKG and certainly put somebody on the cardiac monitor because dysrhythmias are the primary cause of death. As I said, it's all an electrolyte uh, related thing. Um, if you look at a, uh, at ECG monitoring, you look at continuous monitoring, what you'll see is QT prolongation from the hypocalcemia, or you may actually see signs of hyperkalemia. So again, if you look at um, the EKG and you see these long QT intervals, um, that may be, again, evidence of hypocalcemia from the hydrofluoric acid burn. So pre-hospital, what can you do? Certainly ABCs and, and just basic life support. Decontamination, right? You know, rinsing and irrigating and things like that. Ice packs to the area may help with, um, you know, vasoconstriction to, to avoid the, certainly the, the, the deeper burn or the, um, the spread. Calcium gluconate gel, you want to give the calcium back. So people who work in places um, in industry where, hydrofluoric acid is used, they'll have calcium gluconate gel um, sort of stationed around the industry. So in, just in case somebody does get a burn. Um, digital burns, if you get burns on your hands or fingers, you can use, um, you know, like over-the-counter Mylanta or Maalox. It uh, contains magnesium, it's magnesium hydroxide, and you can kind of put that on your burn, um, uh, at least initially. Inhalation injuries, uh, of course, oxygen, um, and you can, you can give calci calcium gluconate nebs. So you can use calcium gluconate as a, in a nebulizer. So again, you're, um, you know, you're nebulizing the calcium and of course, transport to the, to the appropriate hospital. If you have evidence of hypocalcemia, and again, these are things like tetany and Chivastek sign, Trousseau sign, 
you might want to give um, calcium by IV. So you can administer calcium gluconate IV or calcium chloride, whichever you have or carry, um, but you certainly want to give calcium if you have evidence of hypocalcemia. Um, just uh, the difference between gluconate and chloride, calcium chloride is irritating to tissues and may cause injury. So you have to make sure that you, know, you have a good IV and it doesn't, certainly doesn't infiltrate. Um, this is the uh, chemical and electrical burn uh, protocol, and you can see here that hydrofluoric acid is included in the protocol with calcium gluconate gel. Again, if you're you know, in an area where they're using it, they most likely or should have the calcium gluconate gel around. Um, again, if you have signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia, you should give calcium by IV. Uh, and again, these are some of the signs of hypocalcemia uh, listed there. So again, this is all in, the, in your protocols. Um, medical legal pitfalls, uh, hydrofluoride, uh, hydrofluoric acid penetrates fingernails and burns the pulp beneath without destroying the nails. So again, if you don't uh, suspect it, if you just you know, look at somebody's hand and say, well, you know, the nails are intact, looks okay. Um, if you don't suspect it, then you're certainly gonna miss it. And then severe burns may produce severe electrolyte disturbances and dysrhythmias. Again, you can, you know, as little as two and a half percent body surface area can cause death. So again, it's not the burn um, as much as it is the electrolyte abnormality. Um, consultations with certainly chemical burns are treated similar to uh, thermal burns. So this is somebody who would probably benefit from going to a burn center as well. So again, questions about hydrofluoric acid, we'll, uh, we'll keep in chat and we'll talk about it at the end. Um, so H is hydrofluoric acid burns. Okay, patient scenario three is a 74 year old male complains of general weakness, right? I don't know how many people have seen this guy, but I think we probably all have. Um, he hasn't been feeling well all day. He's got a bad appetite, poor appetite. He's vomiting, he's got a little diarrhea. You know, he's found on the bathroom floor by his wife. Uh, his, you see his blood pressure, he's hypotensive, his pulse is 84, respiratory rate, as always, is 18, and he's afebrile. Past medical history, he's got renal failure, he's got congestive heart failure, um, and then you get this pre-hospital ECG. Um, and again, these are all real cases, so this is a real uh, pre-hospital 12 lead uh, of this guy. And of course, when he gets to the ER, you get a, a, a better looking 12 lead, so you get a 12 lead that looks like this. Give you a minute. And then um, what happens is you do a life saving intervention, and the EKG then looks like this. So, this is hyperkalemia, um, and hyperkalemia, high potassium, is defined as a measured serum potassium greater than 5.5. Uh, clinical manifestations usually result from derangement in membrane polarization. We'll talk about that. Cardiac manifestations are the most serious. Um, so you do see ECG changes. Uh, when the potassium gets to about six and a half to seven and a half, you get tall peak T waves, you get a short QT and you prolong PR. So um, we're all taught to look for these tall peak T waves initially. As the uh, potassium starts to get a little bit uh, uh, more, so seven and a half to eight, the QRS widens, you get flattening of the P wave. And when it gets real high in the 10 to 12 range, the QRS may degrade to a sine wave. Um, so this guy, um, you know, this, this is the, initially, again, you see the peak T waves, you see the, the, the T waves, especially out here, V4, V5, you see these big T waves that are actually, you know, taller than the QRS. That's your first sort of um, hint. And then, you know, uh, as like this guy's EKG, you know, as it starts to get up into the seven and a half, eight, nine range, um, you get this widened QRS, you, could, you, know, you lose the P wave, um, and it just starts to eventually look like a sine wave. So again, this is hyperkalemia. So how are we going to manage this? Well, there are three phases to management. First, we want to stabilize the membrane, especially the cardiac membrane. And we talked about how this is a, a membrane problem. Um, we want to shift potassium from extracellular to intracellular, get it out of the extracellular space and then eventually remove it all from the body. So we remove potassium from the body. So this is just what's happening in the membrane. And this is you know, a little more detailed than we're gonna talk about tonight, but certainly there's exchanges going on between sodium and potassium and calcium. Um, and they're all sort of uh, interrelated, I, again, to uh, stabilize the, 
um, the card, especially the cardiac membrane. So um, the first thing you want to do is give calcium, uh, calcium chloride. Again, that stabilizes the, the, um, uh, the cardiac membrane. And then um, we want to redistribute the potassium. We want to get it from the extracellular to the intracellular space. And for that, you can use sodium bicarb, um, one to two amps over two minutes, or you can actually do um, an albuterol NEB. Um, actually also moves potassium from extracellular to intracellular. And then elimination, what we have in our um, disposal for EMS certainly is um, Lasix. And I know that Lasix is in and out of the protocol or not or whatever, but certainly, um, you know, when people have la get Lasix, they, you know, they, they um, it's a diuretic, but they also lose potassium that way. So what happened with this guy was, you know, I said the life-saving intervention, what happened was he got bicarb. So the, the EKG that, that, sort of wide QRS EKG that you saw initially after he got bicarb, it tightened up the, the um, QRS just by giving um, bicarb. And the reason that the, the bicarb work is because of the sodium. So again, I told you calcium and sodium and potassium are all interchanged on the membrane. So it's actually the sodium that does um, the work with sodium bicarb. So uh, again, this is a, a protocol. This is um, dialysis and renal failure. This guy, if you remember, his uh, one of his past medical histories was renal failure, and certainly he um, uh, became uh, hyperkalemic from renal failure. This is out of a textbook. Again, um, some of the I, the therapies I mentioned are things that you can do, you know, in the field. Certainly, once the, the patient gets to the hospital, we're going to do some other things. We're going to do insulin and glucose, uh, you know, to uh, again stabilize the membrane, and then we can give things like um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the um, sodium polystyrene and, and and resins like that that will actually have make the patient have diarrhea or or at least a lot of bowel movements to get rid of potassium that way. So again, that's how we eliminate it from the body. So that's hyperkalemia, uh, just a, a quick version of hyperkalemia. Again, you know, jot down your questions. If you have questions, we'll, you can put them in the chat and we'll talk about them after. Whoops. And um, with a little bit of poetic justice here, your rhythmic disturbances are R. So tension to orthoric hydrofluoric acid and then hyperkalemia is our rhythm disturbance. Okay, next, scenario four. This is a 23-year-old female. She's six months pregnant. She's a passenger in the car. She has a seizure in the car on the way home from her OBGYN appointment. Um, she was evaluated at the scene for, you know, she thought she had some clear discharge, but she was also eating in the car at the time of the seizure, and she's not sure where the fluid is coming from. Um, when you uh, find her, she is post-tictal. Her vital signs are BP is 130 over 80, pulse 80, respiratory rate is 12. She's not febrile. So this is a seizure in a pregnant female. So let's first talk about preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is a disease characterized by the gradual development of high blood pressure, and that's defined as anything over 140 over 90, accompanied by proteinuria and excessive swelling of the legs, hands, and face. So they start... Uh, they start spilling protein into the urine and they have this, um, you know, edematous um, legs, hands, and face. Usually develops after the 20th week of gestation. So this is uh, certainly later on. Um, and what defines eclampsia, preeclampsia becomes eclampsia if a seizure occurs. So that's what happened in this young girl. She had a seizure. So um, she now has eclampsia. So who gets preeclampsia? Who's prone to this is um, people with their first pregnancy, certainly uh, if they are overweight, if they have underlying medical issues like hypertension, diabetes, kidney disease prior to becoming pregnant, multiple gestations are, are at risk, a family history in another um, female, whether it be the sister or the mother, um, if they've had a previous pregnancy with preeclampsia, certainly they're at risk for preeclampsia again. Uh, the extremes of age, right? So age younger than 20 or greater than uh, 35 to 40. And preeclampsia in general occurs in about 5% of pregnancies. So it's not all that common. What are some of the symptoms? Well, again, you have high blood pressure, you have uh, increased fluid. So uh, some of the symptoms can be headache, uh, trouble with vision, 
again, things you would think of with high blood pressure, um, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, shortness of breath, decreased fetal activity, uh, vaginal bleeding, um, and again, edema of the hands and face or weight and, and, a, and a weight gain of about a pound a day. So that's all, and then it's all fluid weight. So again, protein in the urine, weight gain, um, hypertension is all preeclampsia. Uh, morbidity and mortality, what happens is that preeclampsia, again, can progress to either eclampsia by, by the patient having a seizure or the what we call the HELP syndrome. So that's H-E-L-L-P. So H is for hemolysis. So what they do is they start to break down um, blood cells. They get microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So they get hemolysis. They get elevated liver enzymes. So it starts to damage the liver. They get hepatocellular damage and then low platelets. So they're at risk for bleeding. Um, you can see us again, a small percentage, five to 10% of patients with preeclampsia go on to develop this HELP syndrome. And that can be certainly life-threatening. The course of the disease, the persistent severe preeclampsia may lead to, a, of course, a seizure, then, it's, then it becomes eclampsia. Uh, because of the hypertension, they could have a stroke, they could have heart failure, liver rupture, again, it, it affects the liver, or kidney damage. Um, and one of the it could be one of the major causes of maternal death as a result of pregnancy. Certainly, if it gets to this point, um, you know, it could take the life of the mother. Um, they are also at increased risk of placental abruption. You can imagine with the hypertension, with the high blood pressures, you know, it could, uh, you know, tear the placenta um, loose. And they, there's no real cure except for the delivery of the baby. So um, if patients become preeclamptic, if they start to become hypertensive and they start to spill protein into the urine, especially later on in pregnancy, these are patients that may actually be induced early um, because the delivery of the baby is going to be the cure. So on physical exam, one of the things that you'll find, certainly you'll find a pregnant female, but certainly one of the things you'll find when you test reflexes is that they're very hyperreflexic. So very hyperreflexic people um, with exam. Um, medications, let's talk about medications. Um, seizures occur, again, they, they go from preeclampsia to eclampsia in, again, a small percentage, three to 7% of of women who are not given medication to prevent them. So again, if you are an obstetrician, you're worried about your patient becoming, you know, preeclamptic, you're worried about seizures, um, you may wanna give medications. Um, about half of um, seizures during childbirth, right around childbirth occur among those who've received little or no prenatal care. That kind of makes sense. People who, you know, don't know they're preeclamptic, they haven't had their blood pressure measured, they haven't had their urine tested, um, are, you know, about half of those people are gonna um, you know, have seizures. And the anticonvulsant of choice here is going to be magnesium sulfate. We'll talk about that in a second. Can I ask you to um, just mute yourself, please, so we don't... Um... Thank you. Um, again, severe hypertension should be treated to lower the risk of a maternal stroke. Uh, you know, these patients can get pretty hypertensive, and again, one of the risks is, is stroke. They use medications like hydralazine or labetalol, and, and certainly we can use that you know, in the ER if we need to. So eclampsia, again, is defined by seizure activity or, or being unresponsive or comatose unrelated to other cerebral conditions in an obstetrical patient with preeclampsia. So, you know, you progress, you have preeclampsia, you then have a seizure or you become comatose, then it, then it is um, eclampsia. So again, a very small percentage here, you know, you see 0.5 to 2% of patients with preeclampsia actually progress to eclampsia. So Fortunately, it's not something that we're going to um, see a lot of, but um, you know, certainly that's something we want to we want to know about. So historically, uh, about a quarter of the cases um, happened before labor, and again, these are patients who you know will suddenly start to become hypertensive. Um, about half the cases occur during labor, and again, most of these folks are you know people who didn't get any prenatal care. And here's the sort of the scary part is that 25% or another a quarter of them can occur after delivery. So um, even after the baby is delivered, uh, the mother can be still have preeclampsia and still have seizure um, up until about two months after. So again, it's not something, you know, it, it's important to know in history if somebody is, you know, recently had uh, childbirth. Um, so on physical, the, the patient may have one or more seizures, uh, you know, if they do progress to eclamptic seizures, the seizures generally last 
um, in just about a minute or just a, you know, a minute or so, so 60 to 75 seconds. The face becomes distorted, their eyes protrude, um, they may have some foaming at the mouth. Um, and the, the problem, the real problem, certainly for, especially if somebody is pregnant, is that respiration ceases for the duration of the seizure. So they're essentially apneic during that, during that time. Um, and eclamptic seizures, again, are life-threatening emergencies, require the proper treatment to decrease the maternal uh, morbidity and mortality. Um, so typical care, ABCs, you get them in the left lateral position. Why? Because you want to get the gravid uterus off of the inferior vena cava, right? So you want to get them on their left side. Uh, again, I said before, magnesium sulfate is the anticonvulsant of choice, so you're going to use magnesium. And delivery is the treatment after stabilization. And again, if these people um, are close to their delivery time or close to their term, then, then they're probably going to be induced to deliver or have a C-section to deliver to, you know, for the cure. There is a protocol, again, for um, a protocol for everything, right? But there's a protocol for uh, preeclampsia and eclampsia. Eclamptic seizures may occur up to two months postpartum. Again, you don't want to forget about it after the, the mother has given birth. It can still be a complication. And then in, you know, for seizures, uh, again, the, the magnesium, sulfate magnesium is the uh, first line medication. So magnesium, let's talk about magnesium. How does it work? Well, it inhibits the release of acetylcholine at the motor end plate. And acetylcholine is the, you know, the neural messenger, right, that, that makes the muscle work. So it has a direct effect on skeletal muscle by competing with calcium. So it doesn't, um, you know, so it stops the motor activity of the muscle, so to speak. It prevents recurrent seizures and maintains uterine flow and fetal blood flow. Um, and the dose, it's, you know, it's a pretty high dose. So one to four grams IV or three minutes, and you may actually get up to about four or six grams. So this is, uh, again, this is, um, you know, the, the treatment of eclamptic seizures, magnesium. You want to monitor for loss of reflexes. Um, as I said, you know, people with preeclampsia are hyperreflexic. So certainly that'd be, you know, as you monitor their reflexes, you may notice that they um, are diminishing, and that's uh, a sign of magnesium toxicity. Um, also, if they can get respiratory depression from magnesium uh, and decreased urine output. The good thing is that we have the antidote, and we and we carry the antidote because we carry calcium. Um, so calcium is the antidote for magnesium toxicity. So if you happen to be, um, you know, say you're working on a transport ambulance service, and you're transporting a um, a pregnant woman who is preeclamptic um, or eclampsia, uh, you know, they had a seizure or something and they're on a magnesium drip and they start to be respiratory depressed and they lose their reflexes, well, certainly you can give calcium as the antidote. Valium, any of the, uh, the benzos, right? Valium, Ativan, um, uh, the medazolam, Versed, should not be used to stop or shorten a seizure, especially in a woman who's pregnant because they have significant fetal CNS depressant effects. So you can't, that's why the magnesium is the anticonvulsant of choice. You don't want to use benzos because it does um, affect the baby. Medical legal pitfalls, um, failure to rule out a clampsy in an OB patient who has been involved in an unexplained trauma. So if you get a, uh, you know, a pregnant woman who is at the bottom of the stairs or uh, you know, ran her car off the road and, and, and for some unexplained reason, you have to then you know, consider that maybe she had a seizure and that's what uh, precipitated the whole thing. So again, just to think about eclampsia in those cases. So questions, again, file them away in the, in the chat box. Um, so we have um, completed up through E now, that's eclampsia. Next, patient scenario five, this is a 75-year-old male who developed low back pain while driving his car. Um, his wife drives him into your fire station. He has a history of kidney stones. Uh, he has a history of hypertension. Uh, he's got a couple of stents. You can see his BP there. He's a little bit hypertensive, 100 over 60, pulse 88. Respiratory is 20, he's a febrile. And so you bring him into the station and you lie him down in your exam room and he looks something like this. Um, well, you know, it should only, it should all be as obvious as this. This is a, a triple A, right? An abdominal aortic aneurysm. 
and that's defined as a focal dilatation with at least a 50% increase over normal diameter. So at least a 50% increase in the size of the aorta and kind of balloons. And what happens is you, um, you have a weakening of the arterial wall uh, as a result of atherosclerotic vascular disease. And then the wall kind of balloons out. Um, other causes can be infection, uh, cystic medial necrosis, arteritis, trauma, some inherited connective tissue diseases, um, but typically it's the atherosclerotic vascular disease that, that causes these things. The majority, you know, up to 90, 95% of them involve the infrarenal aorta, so below where the, the kidneys come off, so the lower part of the aorta. Um, it occurs in about 5 to 7% of the population older than 60. That's a little bit scary. Certainly a family history is a risk factor. Of course, smoking, coronary artery disease, hypertension, again, all the atherosclerotic risk factors are, are there. Um, most patients are asymptomatic, um, and rarely patients present with symptoms representing rupture. So um, most of the times these are found, you know, for another reason. They've done a CAT scan for some other reason or, or whatever, but most are asymptomatic. The most typical presentation of rupture of one of these things, though, is abdominal or back pain with a pulsatile abdominal mass. Um, symptoms may include groin pain, syncope, paralysis, or a flank mass. Um, and again, these are people who, you know, if they come in with low back pain or low abdominal pain and or groin pain, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, they're written off as, uh, you know, UTI or a kidney stone or something that, um, you know, is certainly less important than finding uh, the AAA. Occasionally, athero atheroembolic uh, events occur from these um, AAAs, and they produce something called levito reticularis of the feet, or blue toe syndrome. And what happens is you get these little emboli flicking off the AAA, and they end up in the, they lodge in the feet distally, and you may see somebody with these little blue feet. So um, again, in the right scenario, if you have somebody with uh, abdominal or back pain and or a pulsatile mass uh, on palpation, and you see this, um, you know, you've made the diagnosis of, of AAA. Again, most often under the infrarenally, so below where the renal arteries take off. This is one intraoperatively. It's not a good picture really to kind of show. Um, this is on ultrasound. Certainly we, we're doing a lot of ultrasound these days, even pre-hospitally sometimes. Um, so on ultrasound, if you get real good at ultrasound, you can pick up a... Um, uh, a AAA on ultrasound. If not, CAT scan, and this is a, a CAT scan. This is a, again, this is a slice of the patient, you know, looking up from the feet towards the head, and you see this big thing in the center here. This is the big aorta um, coming down at you. So, and again, you can kind of follow it along. In these pictures, the aorta is, is big. You can see this big round thing coming towards you. And in this case, this is an aorta, uh, an aortic aneurysm with a rupture, and you can see the you know, it's bleeding out here, bleeding out of the wall there. So that's a ruptured um, AAA. So out of hospital, what do we do? Well, you certainly want to suspect the diagnosis, right? So again, in the right age group, in the right, uh, you know, people with the right risk factors and certainly, you know, uh, low abdominal pain, back pain, you know, things like that, you want to suspect the diagnosis. Um, ABCs, as always, treat for shock. This is, these are people that are going to need large bore IVs and fluid resuscitation, especially if the thing is ruptured or rupturing. And you want to go to the transport to the appropriate facility. Now, these people are certainly going to need emergency surgery um, in a place where they can do vascular surgery. And certainly you want to pick the appropriate facility for that. Pain management. Don't forget about pain management because this is painful, especially if the thing is rupturing um, that is uh, you know, causing some pain. So again, this is in the, the um, consideration in the abdominal pain uh, protocol. Um, and this is a, a AAA should be considered in any patient greater or equal than 50 with abdominal pain, especially if they have hypotension, poor perfusion, or shock. So if you have abdominal pain with, you know, um, uh, with a shocky picture, uh, again, think about AAA. Some pearls, um, uh, greater than 50% of patients with pre-hospital rupture don't survive to the ER. Now, uh, imagine, you know, your aorta ruptures, right? So um, you don't have a lot of time to deal with, uh, with that. So uh, about 50, more than half of patients are going to die um, 
you know, before they get to the hospital. If they do survive and get to the hospital, survival drops off 1% every minute. So again, this is a, you know, needs to be dealt with in a timely fashion, certainly. And that's why you go to the appropriate facility. And survival is best in those that receive timely surgical intervention. So again, if you can get in there and fix it or repair it, um, certainly that's a greater chance of survival. Uh, a little bit of history, uh, medical history. If uh, you know, if you've done my rounds before, you know I like medical history. The, the first AAA was actually identified back in the 16th century. So again, this is something that's been described, um, you know, long ago in in medical history. Um, in 1948, there was a surgeon that actually wrapped it in cellophane, wrapped an aneurysm in cellophane um, in order to induce fibrosis and limit expansion. So they kind of, you know, just wrapped it around with cellophane to, to um, keep it to keep it together. Um, and that was that technique was actually used on Albert Einstein in 1949. Now, Albert Einstein had a triple A, was wrapped in cellophane, um, and he survived for another six years um, before it ruptured. So this is what we're doing nowadays. These, uh, you know, these, you know, stents and and uh, you know, vascular procedures where they can just, you know, sort of replace the aorta there um, or bypass it, if you will. Uh, but again, this is sort of the modern technology. Okay, questions. Um, again, you know what to do. So. Moving on, so we have A as our triple A, we have our final T. Um, this patient is a 45 year old male. And this is, a, this is actually a guy that I saw um, that I will not forget. So this is a 45 year old guy who came in with the inability to move his legs. Uh, he was on the toilet. He was straining to have a bowel movement and, he, and all of a sudden he passed some blood per rectum and then he couldn't move his legs at all. Um, his past history is that of, he has had a couple of MIs, he's got some stents, hypertension, COPD a little bit of alcohol use. You can see his vitals there. So this guy came in, you know, screaming, you know, I can't move my legs, I can't move my legs. And, um, you know, of course, uh, you know, when you, you know, have a sort of a, uh, an anchoring bias, you think, uh, you know, this guy's crazy, right? This guy's, yeah, you can't move your legs after having a bowel movement. And um, so they put him in the, you know, we had a, we had a room that, you know, was a multi-bed room for, you know, behavioral health patients. So, that, so they put him in there and I went to see him and I tested his reflexes and things because he said he couldn't move his legs and really he had no reflexes and he really um, could not uh, move his legs um, after having a bowel movement. And I don't think that had anything to do with it, but what happened is we ended up sending him the CT scan and um, this is the CT. And if you can, let's see, I think we zoom in. Um, what you can see here is the aorta and you can see, um, you know, that there's a big, there's clot in the aorta. Uh, and what's happening here is that he's actually, you can see it here um, better. So this is the arch of the aorta and you can see that there's um, sort of a line there, there's blood there, there's blood there and there's blood on either side of the line. So what's happening is that he is actually dissecting his thoracic aorta. Um, and that's what was happening with this guy. So. Um, the aortic dissection is the most common catastrophe of the aorta, and it's two to three times more common than the rupture of a AAA that we just talked about. So this is a, um, a thoracic di dissection, and it's certainly up higher, um, and then much more common than, than lower. So left untreated, about a third of them will die in the first 24 hours, uh, half of them will die within 48, and 75% will die within, within two weeks. So this is a bad thing to have, right? The, when you're thoracic, <clears throat> excuse me, when your thoracic aorta dissects, this is uh, certainly bad. And what happens is if you look at the aorta, the aorta is a, uh, a muscular uh, a walled um, vessel, right? It has the, um, the intima, the media, and the adventitia in the, in the muscular wall. There's, there's the three layers of the, of the muscle. And what happens is that blood dissects in between the muscle layers of the aortic wall. So you can see that the, the uh, sort of the diagram there where blood will sort of dissect in, into those muscle layers and then kind of start, a, you know, tearing into that muscle, if you will. And this is just another picture here. You can see how, again, it just kind of dissects into the, into the muscle layers. <clears throat> and what happens or what you'll see then, again, as we saw on the CAT scan, is that you see blood dissecting into that area um, and so you have blood in the artery where it belongs, and then you have blood dissecting through the wall where it doesn't belong. And, and again, it kind of looks like this, kind of that this picture here. 
And so this guy had a uh, thoracic dissection. <clears throat> so what are the, uh, you know, what are the predisposing conditions? Well, certainly hypertension, if you have high blood pressures, you, you have a, um, the, you know, the high pressures can dissect into the wall, congenital heart disease, anything that kind of weakens the, the muscle, connective tissue disease, same thing, certainly people with, you know, you know Marfan syndrome and things are, are, are very classic for um, thoracic artery di dissection. And pregnancy, pregnancy is a predisposing condition. Um, this is probably a little more than we need to know, but there are different classifications um, of uh, thoracic dissection. The Stanford is, is actually the easiest because it's either ascending, which is A, or it's descending, which is B. So it's either a Stanford A or a Stanford B um, by definition. Uh, DeBakey, DeBakey was a famous cardiac surgeon, and he had another classification where it was DeBakey 1, 2, and 3, and you can see the definitions there. Um, one is the whole aorta, two is the ascending, three is descending. And again, this is probably, you know, more than we need to know, but certainly if you want to describe it to somebody, if they, you say it was the Stanford A or B, uh, you know, that, that could be helpful. Uh, the pain that's associated is, um, you know, chest pain is the most common presenting symptom. Certainly you have, you know, blood ripping through the muscle layers of your aorta, um, the pain is usually described as a ripping or tearing because that's essentially what's happening, right? You have a, a ripping through the layers. Um, the, the sudden onset of pain that has a sensitivity of 84%, meaning that, you know, if you have somebody with chest pain that came on suddenly, just very, you know, very suddenly out of nowhere, um, you know, the sensitivity of that being a, a trip or a thoracic dissection is, is pretty high. The other problem, though, is that this is often mistaken for musculoskeletal conditions. Um, so another guy that I saw with a, um, um, a thoracic dissection was a guy who was opening a window, um, and the window was kind of painted shut, so he really had a struggle to open the window. And after opening the window, he had um, back pain. He had pain between his shoulder blades, and he came into the hospital with pain between his shoulder blades after opening a window. Um, and there's always sort of a, you know, people always want to attribute a cause to their, their symptoms. And certainly um, he thought it was from opening a window. Um, as it turned out, he had a thoracic dissection as well. Um, so again, it's distinguished from the pain of, a, of an MI by its abrupt onset. And again, and we just sort of described that, you know, how a, somebody with a, a heart attack can kind of been a little bit indolent and kind of develops over time, whereas this happens abruptly. Um, and it, should be considered when in an acute, sudden, severe chest pain, maximal at onset. So again, if somebody comes in and says the pain is, you know, was bad right away, um, you should you should think about this. And the problem is that the, the aortic wall, not, not only is it a muscular wall, but it also has nerve fibers. So that's why it's so painful is that the nerves actually, you know, sense the pain. So anterior chest pain and chest pain that mimics MI are, are associated with anterior arch or aortic root dissection. Sometimes the, um, so again, depending on where the pain is may indicate where the dissection is. Neck or jaw pain um, is more towards the arch and extends into the great vessels of the arch. Um, a terrier, again, a tearing or ripping pain in the intrascapular area, again, between the scapula and the back, between the, in the middle of the back is more of a, a descending aorta um, problem. The problem is, is that can, it can be painless in about 10% of patients. So, um, and what you'll see there more often are neurologic signs, uh, like the guy that I saw. His their neurologic signs was that he couldn't move his legs. So again, um, maybe not pain, but more neurologic findings. And if you think about it, as the, as the aorta dissects down the arch and down the back, um, you know, what was happening with this guy, the guy that I saw is he was knocking off his spinal arteries. So his spinal cord was, um, you know, becoming ischemic um, and he couldn't feel or then move his legs um, as, the, as the dissection moved down the aorta. So what happens with it? Again, I told you about the spinal cord, this guy being paraplegic, but what if it dissects up? If it dissects up into the carotids, you know, starts to go up the carotids, um, you may actually present with stroke symptoms. So again, you may, um, somebody with neurologic symptoms may be um, a, a dissection that's going up into the carotids. The spinal cord, I, I just told you about the abdominal 
I, again, if it goes down into the abdomen or the flank, you, know, you may have some abdominal or flank pain. If it dissects in the aortic root, um, you may actually get pericardial tamponade, right? It may actually leak into the pericardium um, and or um, dissect into the carotids and then it look like you're having an MI. So it, again, it depends on where the dissection is occurring, what's happening as to what kind of symptoms you're gonna see. Um, a lot of people will say, well, you know, for thoracic dissection, I, you, you know, you can take a blood pressure in the right arm, take a blood pressure in the left arm. Um, there've been no specific thresholds of blood pressure changes between the extremities that will clearly identify dissection. So although it may be helpful, it's not going to be um, diagnostic. So again, neurologic findings um, can be present in up to about 20% of cases. And certainly, uh, you know, the guy I'm talking about uh, was neurologic. Um, most common are syncope and altered mental status, again, depending on where it's dissecting. Um, syncope in about 5% of patients may be a result of increased vagal tone, hypovolemia, dysrhythmia. And again, that's just uh, something to think about, um, uh, you know, in people who um, have pain, you know, maybe have some back pain or something and then pass out. And disruption of um, flow to the spinal arteries is the case that, that we're talking about is where the guy actually became paraplegic. Imaging, again, you know, not something you're going to do, but if you see or get a chest x-ray, it, it may be abnormal in, in a majority of patients. So you may see a widened mediastinum. You know, again, if the, um, the aortic arch is dissecting and it's becoming wider, you may see some widening in the mediastinum, an abnormal aortic knob on the x-ray. Um, the trachea may deviate, again, because of the increased space there. Um, depression of main stem bronchus, esophageal de deviation. Again, these are all, um, you know, sort of uh, radiologic findings that, you know, you may or may not see on, on chest x-ray, but certainly, um, um, you know, the widened mediastinum and stuff is, you know, may occur. Angiography, um, certainly today we use CT angiography. So angiography is, is uh, you know, going to be the test of choice where you do a CTA uh, a CT with um, dye so that you see the actual uh, vessels. You can also do TEE as transesophageal um, echocardiogram. Um, again, not really not practical in the emergency setting. Uh, MRI, if you you know if you're doing MRI to find this, it's you know you're probably going to be too late. So how do you treat it? Well, certainly antihypertensives um, because, again, it's usually high pressures that are dissecting through the walls. You want to make sure the blood pressure is under control. You can use beta blockers. You can do nitroprusside. Again, these are, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of drips that they'll be on that you can sort of maintain blood pressure uh, in a specific range. If they happen to be hypotensive, that does require fluid or blood products. Again, you want to make sure that you know, whatever is left, you're, you're perfusing. So certainly if somebody presents with what you believe to be a um, thoracic dissection and they're hypotensive, then you treat it with resuscitation. Um, here's the difference with classification. An ascending aortic dissection requires prompt surgical repair. There's no question about that. If it's, if it's the ascending aorta, that has to be surgically fixed, whereas the descending aorta can sometimes be managed medically. So not always a surgical case. Medical legal pitfalls, if coronary insufficiency is suspected, nitrates um, may be used. Um, again, if you, you know, if you, if you think it's an MI uh, or, or even if it is, uh, you know, a dissection causing an MI, you can still use nitrates. Um, and of course, therapy with thrombolytics and aspirin should be avoided. That, that should certainly make sense. Um, you know, we're not using TPA or thrombolytics much, if at all now for, for MI, but certainly uh, you wouldn't want to give somebody with a dissection, um, you know, TPA or even aspirin um, as it increases your chances of bleeding. So again, any questions on that, you can, we can certainly um, address. So we've, um, we've rounded out our threat, right? So T, tension pneumothorax, we talked about uh, the importance of that. Hydrofluoric acid burns, though rare, um, can certainly cause some electrolyte abnormalities. Rhythm disturbance, uh, particularly hyperkalemia, what to recognize on EKG and how to treat that. Eclampsia, again, although rare, we don't want to miss, you know, a seizure in, a, uh, in, an, in an obstetric patient. 
uh, a triple A. Um, again, you know, be wary of diagnoses like uh, you know kidney stones and things in, in older people. And then the thoracic aorta dissection uh, again may be something uh, you know pain that happens abruptly and or uh, accompanied by neurologic findings. So that is um, a threat. Uh, so that we can again we don't want to. These are six diagnoses we we certainly don't want to miss. Uh, I hope that I, um, you know, again, we don't want to, we don't want to uh, do any harm if we, if, if at all possible. Uh, and I hope that I have certainly um, given you some, uh, uh, some help in the future and, um, you know, giving you the opportunity to not miss some of these deadly things. So if uh, anybody has any questions now, um, I will certainly take a look at the chat. All right, sorry if I missed the answer to this. For those of us who are not allowed to give magnesium sulfate, is there a point where we should consider the use of benzos in preeclampsia or is immediate transport a best course? I would say if the, it depends on where you are in the pregnancy, right? So if the, if the patient is pregnant, and obviously you should be able to tell that, uh, I would avoid using benzos again because it, there is uh, risk to the fetus and, and the baby. So if you can't give magnesium, then I would not give benzos. Now, if you're in this, if you're in the case where a, a mother who you know gave birth a month ago now is having a seizure, and that by definition is eclampsia, then at that time I would use um, I would use benzos because of course there's no risk to the, the fetus being already born. So that's my suggestion there. Anybody with any other questions? Again, for the for the folks that are on, um, I um, again we had a you know we had a, a disruption in our schedule tonight. I had to you know put this together. So um, again, I thank you for your patience with that. But certainly, you know, we're always looking for topics. So if you have any um, if you have any ideas for topics or anything that you want to hear about, please uh, you know share those as well. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about pain management in AAA? What would you use, et cetera? Well, I think that I think now with you know fentanyl being um, you know your your sort of number one or go to drug for for pain, I think that's good. Uh, you know, there's uh, you know less drop in blood pressure with that, so certainly that's uh, uh, you know you don't have to worry about blood pressure as much with with fentanyl. Um, so I think that that's Again, I think that that's a, an appropriate drug for that. Any other questions or thoughts? Again, like I said, if you know, we're always looking for topics. If you want to, you know, you can send it to me in chat. You can send it to Eileen. Eileen has been uh, extremely helpful. Uh, you know getting me through rounds and, and, you know, you certainly have her email, my email, whatever you can um, certainly pass on ideas for, for topics and we'll see what we can get to. All right, so I'm, I think I'll stop the recording now.